Hi, everybody. It's Deirdre Fay from Safely Embodied, and I am totally and 100% thrilled to bring Deb Dana here with us today. And Deb is an amazing teacher, for one thing, and I call her the Pied Piper of polyvagal theory. She knows the polyvagal theory inside and out. She's taken the incredible work of Steve Porges and made it really clinically accessible for those of us who are trying to use it and apply it into our work. So it's a big thrill of mine to have her here. Deb's been a friend and colleague for I don't know how many years. Oh my God, it might be decades at this point, Deb. Probably. <laughs> We're getting of that age. We could talk about that. Yes. Um, and she does trainings and workshops, and I'll give you more information about it. But I want you to know that she is both a clinician and a researcher. Now she's starting a research project at the Kinsey Institute in studying how to deal with complex trauma from the polyvagal point of view. She's developed uh, what she calls the Rhythm of Regulation Clinical Training Series, and she teaches and lectures internationally on ways to use polyvagal theory in especially in the work of trauma people. So in addition to that, Deb has also co-edited with Steve Porges the clinical applications of the polyvagal theory, uh, which is coming out uh, from Norton Publishing this year, right, Deb, sometime this year? Yep, in June. Mm -hmm. In June. In addition, at the same time, this is how prodigious Deb is, she's also the author of her own book, The Polyvagal Theory, in therapy, um, engaging the rhythm of regulation, which also comes out this year. And is that also in June? Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness gracious. Yes. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous. They're both coming out the same month. Okay. I'm mind blown already. So what I would like Deb to do is just give an overview of the polyvagal theory so that those of you who aren't familiar can get a sense of it and also a sense of Deb's teaching and what she brings to us in the book and why you want to pre-order the book, which is available for pre-order now on Norton's website and also on Amazon. But And you'll see from being with her about how absolutely applicable the material is. Um, and then we're going to go into some more practicalities around it. So Deb, talk Great. to us. Oh, lovely to be here and talk about my passion, polyvagal theory. So. <laughs> <laughs> the Pied Piper, I like that. That was sweet. Um, so yes, polyvagal theory, I call it um, the science of feeling safe enough to engage with life and take mm -hmm. the risks of living. So oh, really what we're, what we're talking about here when we're using a polyvagal perspective on both clinicians and regular people, because this is about life. The autonomic nervous system is the foundation of all of our lived experience. So what I'm working with is not a... Um, treatment modality, but rather a, um, a, a model, an approach that sits underneath all the other ways that we've been trained. You know, I'm, an, I'm IFS trained and polyvagal sits underneath and gives IFS a platform to be on. I'm sensory motor trained, the same for that. So any of the ways we're trained, polyvagal is underneath it, giving it a foundation. So the three organizing principles of polyvagal theory to make it to make it simple, are neuroception, hierarchy, and co-regulation. So let's take them one at a time. So neuroception is the word Steve created um, because there wasn't a word that was really talking about how the nervous system is listening, right? It's not perception because the nervous, the nervous system is subcortical. It's below the level of conscious awareness. It's brainstem down. So we needed a word that didn't involve thinking. So Steve coined the term neuroception, which is detection without awareness. And it's happening all the time. Like at this moment for you and me, our neuroception is just taking in cues, right? Looking for cues of safety and cues of danger. And how I like to think about it is it's working inside, outside, and between. So meaning inside, inside my body, it's feeling what's going on outside in the environment. It's taking in what's going on and between between our nervous systems it's getting cues okay so that's neuroception and we work with neuroception by bringing perception to neuroception because neuroception is this implicit running in the background experience that we then bring into explicit awareness so that we can work with it so triggers are 
cues of danger that come into the neuroceptive experience in the nervous system and then get fed up from the body to the brain and we make a story. So those are the triggers. The triggers, they trigger our physiology and then our psychology makes a story to make sense of it. So those are triggers and then what I call glimmers, which I love, glimmers are the cues of safety that are coming into our nervous system that are telling us, ooh, this is safe. We can connect, we can be socially engaged. So triggers and glimmers are these lovely things that are happening all the time. And when you work with complex trauma um, clients, we're, we're look, we find the triggers often, and it's really important to look for the glimmers too, right? It's important to help those trauma survivors understand they, they are experiencing glimmers too. Hmm. even though we sort of bypass them, you know, that great negativity bias we come into the world with, we bypass the glimmers. So notice the glimmers. Is that is so important. Yeah. I think Deb, that it's almost, we are so prone to know, like we're aware of our triggers and what's that accused of non-safety, but to develop that, the glimmers. I love that. Yeah. Good. Good. So I, I, when I send emails to clients, I often end it with wishing you a day of glimmers. Ah, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So that's neuroception, you know, this internal surveillance system that we all have and that gets shaped according to our experience, okay? Because the nervous system gets shaped in relationship with other nervous systems. So experiences shape the nervous system. So our neuroception gets toned. You know, cues of, of danger for you might not be cues of danger for me and vice versa. So we're, we're, we're looking how our nervous system is shaped. And with trauma survivors, it's been shaped in a certain trajectory, probably more away from connection and towards protection, right? So let's move to hierarchy, which takes us further into survival responses. So Steve um, developed this um, lovely um, way of thinking about the nervous system through his work with um, understanding that the parasympathetic nervous system is more than this rest and digest system that it was always thought to be, right? So we have parasympathetic and sympathetic, and he discovered that the parasympathetic brings two kinds of response. One, this lovely safe and social connection, and the other, this experience of immobilization and collapse and dissociation. So these are brought from this one nerve, the vagus, but the two different ends of it, okay? So if we start at the top of the hierarchy, and in my work, what I did was take Steve's hierarchy and um, put it on a ladder. So my you know, basic metaphor is a ladder. So we have the autonomic ladder, and at the top of the ladder is this state of ventral vagal safety and connection. Um, I have um, images on my website of little people standing on top of a ladder, happily, enjoying the world. It's that place where um, you can see and engage and you can be, be happy by yourself or happy with others. The ventral vagal state um, is one that has lots of different um, behaviors and feelings, but the basic tone is one of safety. I feel safe enough to be in the world. So that's ventral vagal, the state we want to be in. And that's the state when our system is open to change because we're in a state of safety and connection. So with our work with trauma survivors, we need to have enough ventral vagal on board for their system to be willing to look at change. Mm -hmm. okay? We move from there, the next step down, so down the ladder a few rungs, is when we enter the sympathetic nervous system state of fight or flight, right? And the neuroception is one of danger. So there are cues of danger coming in that prompt our autonomic nervous system to move into fight or flight. And that's where the HPA axis gets engaged and cortisol and adrenaline. And we can feel this mobilization system happening, right? So sympathetic nervous system takes us to that place. It's the first of the adaptive survival responses fight flight mobilization too much energy flooding my system and you know when you're in that state you could feel it right you can probably think of a time recently when you were you had that flooding your system and you can see it in your clients when when their sympathetic nervous system has taken control and when that happens our system is no longer looking for connection no longer interested in connection it is only interested in survival mm -hmm. and that survival takes us out of connection okay so 
you know, oftentimes that will resolve what the perceived danger is and we'll come back into ventral vagal. We do this a lot of times a day, sympathetic ventral, sympathetic ventral, but sometimes we're not able to resolve the issue and our nervous system can't stay in sympathetic. And so it goes to the bottom of the ladder, which is dorsal vagal. No, but Deb, let's pause there for a minute. Why can't our nervous system stay there and keep regulating? What, what would have us drop into that? In sympathetic, there's going to be a, a point where your sympathetic nervous system um, um, exhausts itself where you're, and again, remember, we, we have thoughts that are going along with the um, nervous system state. Your thoughts are going to be ones of, um, they move from get me out of here, or I'm going to fight, or I can, you know, I can manage this to giving up. You start to teeter in that direction. And as soon as that happens, you're going down to dorsal vagal collapse, which is the body's way of going into conservation mode. All right. All right. right. Okay. You know, and it's that, it's that place where the, you know, it's the, a time out. It's when our body says, okay, I need a break. Right. And if I go to this place of immobilization, this death feigning that you see in animals, there's a good possibility that I might survive and be able to come back up and live again. That's the, the neuroception is one of life threat. And so the only option is to go to immobilization, collapse, invisible, disconnect, numb, dissociation. These are all the flavors of dorsal vagal, right? And remember, it's an adaptive survival response. And the other thing we want to remember when we talk about the nervous system is there's no choice. We don't decide which of these we're going to go to. The nervous system is, is taking us because it's, had so many cues of danger that it goes sympathetic um, dorsal or it's getting cues of safety and takes us to ventral. Okay. So that's, that's the hierarchy and it's a predictable hierarchy. You can see it in your clients, you know, it in yourself, right? <laughs> my, my system, I go easily to dorsal because in my family of origin, that was the place that was safe for me to be. So we're shaped by our early experiences. So I still carry a lot of um, ease in going to dorsal vagal disconnect, right? You know, so, you know, and also want to say that we have these extreme shifts the, the, to these discrete states, but we also have a nuance of it. We have flavors of it, you know, so I can feel sometimes in my system a flavor of dorsal vagal. I still have enough like a foot in ventral, so I'm okay, but I can feel the sort of backing up that happens when it feels a little overwhelming. So those are the nuances that we begin to learn to track when we, um, when we work with um, really befriending is the first step, befriend the nervous system, and then learn to attend to it. Right. So those are the first two parts of my my work works and, and um, my book and my work, um, my workshops. So those are got neuroception. We got hierarchy. And now the part that we love the most co-regulation. Right. So the nervous system longs to be in connection with another nervous system. You know, Steve says um, connectedness is a biological imperative, which means that we come into the world wired to connect and we won't survive without another human being. Mm -hmm. We need, and that need it, um, goes with us through our whole life, you know. So even though some of our trauma survivor clients might say there was never anybody there and I learned very early to depend on myself, I don't need anybody, right? Their, their story is I don't need anybody, but their nervous system is still longing for connection. Of course, right. Yeah. And so understanding for our clients and for ourselves that, that that's your biology at work, Right somehow takes away some of the shame and the blame and then makes room for compassion or self-compassion. It's just my physiology doing what it's meant to do. Right. I need connection. I'm longing for it. I'm waiting for it, you know, which is what we all are doing in, in our own way. So co-regulation, which is what we do as therapists with our clients, we have to be in a regulated state so that we can then extend that ventral vagal energy to our clients to help them regulate with us. So our job, I was just writing a little piece about what would you tell a new, new therapist? You know, what would be the thing you would want them to know? And I ended up saying, I want new therapists to understand. So I want all of my colleagues to know that it's our responsibility to be a regulated and regulating nervous system when we are working with our clients, that that's where it begins. It begins here. 
and then extends to my client. So that's, that's a big responsibility, you know, to, to be carrying that. And then if you extend that out from therapy to, to life, you know, it's our responsibility to, to regulate ourselves and then help others regulate. Hmm. Right. It's a lot to, it's a lot to, to be with and we're not perfect at it. Certainly. I, I had a moment in the kitchen the other day when, you know, I was, I was noticing that I was getting very mobilized and I had this, this image of, Oh, there's the ventral vagal train leaving the station and I'm not on it. You know? it's like, nope, not on it. <laughs> so it happens to all of us, these moments of messiness. And so the work for us as therapists is to notice when they happen, because they happen in sessions all the time. Our nervous system will feel a jerk. And then, you know, how do I regulate back into ventral? And how do I let my client know what happened for me? Because the other thing is neuroception is going to pick up on that. Mm, beautiful as, point. That's right. And as soon as that happens, their system is going to make a story. Mm -hmm. And the story's not going to be, wow, Deb just got distracted, right? The story's going to be, oh, she's bored, or I'm too much, or I'm too needy, right? So it's my job to name what just happened autonomically so that my client gets the right information, right? That, that experience they probably didn't get growing up. And in fact, most of us don't get in our daily lives, right? People don't stop and say, oh, this just happened for me right? Here, here's the correct information about what you might be feeling, but here's what happened on my end. Yeah. So in some ways, if you live from a polyvagal um, foundation, it changes the way you live. It changes the way you move through the world, right? You, you begin to, you see others differently and you begin to feel a responsibility to move through the world in a new way, which, which I love. I, 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 I can see it in people I've trained and they, they email me and say, Ooh, not about a client, but about their, their child or their partner or their, their mom or their neighbor, you know, so it just has this beautiful application outside of the therapy office as well. You know, what I also love is that you're naming what seem and see purchased it is name some of the real, um, basic tenets. Like this is something we see in attachment theory as well. Uh, when Dan Stern writes about the intersubjective matrix, it's uh, in the other neuroscience of uh, Vittorio Galesi who talks about the motor neurons. We pick up this information. We are, even though we think, and we are separate selves, and certainly for those of us who are, have had a trauma history, we need to identify our separate selfness mm -hmm. so that we can then be related to another. Right. But we can't forget that we're, that we're not exchanging information all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, the vagus, you know, has, is this conduit of nerves that goes from your medulla, wanders throughout your body. And 80% of the information from the vagus goes from your body to your brain. So 80% of it is coming body to brain. Only 20% comes back brain to body. So what we know is these emergent states of ventral, sympathetic, and dorsal have certain behaviors and beliefs that um, they support and other ones they don't. So if I'm in a sympathetic nervous system state, the emergent properties of those are mobilization, fight, flight, survival, and expecting me to, you know, be in social engagement and connection is biologically impossible. Mm -hmm. so when you're working with couples, you know, and, and, one of the couple has left ventral and it's gone to sympathetic or dorsal, you can help the other one see it's not that he does, he wants to be this way. It's not that he doesn't want to be with you. He biologically can't right now, mm. right? His, his biological biology doesn't support him coming into connection right now. I think that's what's so helpful. And that's what takes the shame out of it or the, there's something wrong with me that, um, that it's, it is, it's just our bodies and how we're wired. That doesn't mean though we're stuck there. Exactly. Because just as the nervous system is shaped by early experience, it continues to be shaped by experience. 
So it's always taking in information and, and, and being shaped. And that's the work of therapy, right? Is to help clients shape their nervous systems um, in new ways towards connection. But let's stay with that because I, I think that's really important. Because there are people, and sometimes myself, I hate to admit it, but where I literally block out the new information coming in. Mm. I'm so ensconced in my old way of being that I, that I, it shapes literally what I see and experience, and I don't see this new information. If I'm talking to you, and I'm so um, biased to thinking people are bad and wrong and hurtful and going to disappoint me, then no matter what you do, I see that. Right. So what hap how do we, from your point of view, how do we shift that or open up the new door or something? Right. It's a nice way to put it because what you're saying is if you are in that state where all you see is that expectation of disappointment and hurt, you know, you're either in a sympathetic mobilized fight or you're in a dorsal vagal disconnect despair. Right. And so, you know, I tell people polyvagal informed therapy is simple, not easy, because it simply is I need to help you come up the ladder to enough ventral vagal so that you can then see differently because your biology will then support there being possibility and options. But as long as you're sympathetic or dorsal, your brain makes a story to match the physiological state. That's what happens. Right. So as I help you, and I will use my ventral vagal energy to, to help you, so this is the co-regulating piece, to be with you where you are and then help you come back into ventral, and then we can look at the story together differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very, it's a lovely joining, right? It's a very, because from ventral I only have understanding compassion for you I'm, I, I'm not judging I'm not I'm not saying you shouldn't be where you are I'm going to go join you in that place you know I call it I have my ventral vagal anchor so it's dug into the ventral vagal ground and then I can come to you in sympathetic or dorsal and be with you and let you know I am firmly in ventral and I can be here with you and so you feel that and you feel that trust in my system's ability to bring us both back that's beautiful right you know, Deb, having been in workshops and trainings with you, I know how practical you are. I know like you bridge this incredible intellectual capacity that Steve Forges puts out and you make it really practical. So part of what I want people to get is how your book is, is that bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering, can you talk about how in the book you – and certainly in your trainings and workshops, how you you break it down for us and make it accessible. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's interesting because the very first thing that I created was the ladder image. Right, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Posted it on my website to see if anybody else would think it was okay, right? You know? So ran it by Steve first and he said, yes, go for it. So that was lovely. He has been a delightful um, supporter and, and friend now. So got to give him all the credit for creating this wonderful transformative theory mm -hmm. really so uh, my the first section of the book is really based on the basic three map um sequence so the first map um and and they're all used the ladder and the first map answered the answers the question where am i because we have to know what autonomic nervous system state we're in before we can do anything so we have to predictably be able to place ourselves on the ladder so as we, we do this for ourselves and we bring this to our clients, the first few weeks are just being able to really say, where am I right now? And then the second map is the triggers and glimmers map. So that identifies for sympathetic and dorsal, what are the triggers, what, what puts me here? And for glimmers, what puts me here, right? So it's this, and so and it's really important to understand that all three states are there for all of us, right? Trauma survivors often say, even in the first map, we map ventral vagal, and they'll say, oh, I don't think I'm ever there. I go, let's, let's think, you know, out in nature with a pet, maybe right here between mm -hmm. you and me right now. You only need a moment, a micro moment, and you can map it. And the first map maps what it feels like, what it looks like, what happens in your body, what are your thoughts. And the two phrases that are so important in that first foundational map, you fill in the sentences, I am and the world is. 
And you do that from each of the states and you get a very clear picture immediately. What are the core beliefs that are at work in each state? And I've done this with probably thousands now of people. And it's so fascinating. Everybody has this, you'll do yours, my clients will do theirs. People in Europe will do theirs, people all over the place, and they all sound the same, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a universal feeling we have. You know, the world is dark, or the world is too much, or I am safe, or I am able to move through the world. They're all, they're just universals. It's really beautiful. The other thing I love about it is that it seems like the autonomic nervous system is sort of the common denominator we all share brings us all together so so anyway that was map one map two was trigger and glimmers and then map three is the regulating resources map and that's where we identify um, what helps me begin to move out of dorsal and sympathetic and what keeps me in ventral Um, and we identify both things I do on my own so self-regulating and things I do with others interactive regulation because both are necessary for a well well well-rounded system and for many of our clients, um, interactive regulation has been dangerous. So they may not have many of those. A lot of my clients have a lot of self-regulating resources, but can't connect with another. And then other people are the opposite. You know, always want to use another, can't do themselves. So it's a great way to, to sort of get a flavor, you know, for clients of where are my strengths and where are my um, places there where I need to add something. So those are the three maps. And once you've done those three maps, you know, the, the first one, where am I? The second one, how did I get here? And the third one, how do I get to ventral, <laughs> right? Those really form the foundation and we keep returning them throughout um, all of our um, therapy together. Even when we're doing other models of therapy, this is the map. Where are you right now? Right? Where did that experience just take you? What's the resource that can help us right now? And so we've mapped those already. We have them there. And the rest of the book is really about um, ways to track, more ways to track, because we need to track over time. And then there's a section on shaping. How do we tone the nervous system? And there are wonderful ways to tone the nervous system, both you know, with breath, with movement, with sound, with writing, with art, with sculpting. So I had fun with the the shaping the nervous system section. It's, it's great fun to try these out in my workshops and then see, Ooh, that one worked really well. <laughs> and some of them didn't make the cut, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah. yeah it, it, you know, so I loved writing the book and, and, you know, the very last section is just sort of a brief look at um, um, play and stillness and awe. And those are sort of blended states. So they're much more difficult for trauma survivors. Um, Play is a blend of sympathetic and ventral vagal and can feel very dangerous to people. Um, Stillness, because as soon as we start getting still, you know, I know you're a meditator. So as soon as you start stilling into meditation, if your system um, can't still and stay ventral, you're going to go to dissociation or collapse. Stillness is that first step towards immobilization. So we have to learn how to do that safely. So the blended states are are an interesting um, um, challenge for for many of us, for many of us. So, you know, then I wrote some autonomic meditations because it seemed like fun to, you know, take people into their nervous system and, and have this, you know, guided experience of being in there. So, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of practical application, and it's really, um, I've tried to make it so that once you do the basic three maps, which I really encourage everybody to do, you can pick and choose, you know, what works for this client or this client, and try to really get a, a variety, because we have a bunch of different kinds of clients, right? You know, some will like music, some will hate it, some will like movement, some will hate it. and So lots of different ways to, to tone the nervous system, because that really is what safety and stabilization is about, right? If we think about trauma work, if we think about phase one, safety and stabilization, this polyvagal approach really works with creating that foundation of safety and stabilization so you can do the trauma processing and the work. Right, and that maps onto so much of the positive psychology and positive neuroscience is 
if we if we have a softer ground it's easier to take right. the pain out without right. um it yeah. being that as disruptive yeah. yeah i i do think this is this not just the polyvagal but this whole orientation mm. is changing the way we do uh trauma treatment in a much much more satisfying way i think for for all parties involved yes yes yeah and if you think about it if you're sitting with a client you know and, and not sure where to go you go back to okay my job is to bring ventral vagal abundance to this moment to this meeting between the two of right. us help the nervous system regulate because the nervous system knows what it needs right. to do next right i am with you 100 percent. and the other piece i would add is how do we not only bring our ventral vagal to the to the moment but how do we train our body to receive that yeah. so that it's in taken more and more yeah. all the time so otherwise there's like a buffer place we think well i can only take so much and we mm -hmm. limit ourselves. Mm -hmm. and for many of our clients in the beginning it's too dangerous to take in any right, right? and right. so you know we work with because again it, it's a it's a physiological system we're working with you know what i found with my clients whose firefighters their parts are so not allowing anything in you know we talk about you know we're, we're just we're working with your body's physiology you know it's there's no story here we simply work with state not story and you can get in that way as soon as story comes in often you know there's a stop but we're just working with your state just kind of feeling into the state and trying to shift the state a bit. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, it's interesting to really notice how if we just work with physiology, I call it autonomic exercising. When we, yeah, <laughs> you know, we sometimes we're allowed in in ways we're not, if we begin to think about story. So, mm. yeah. And you were talking, I, you know, Steve once called benevolence and I use this all the time, the, the active ongoing use of ventral vagal energy in service of healing. And I just think that's beautiful. So, you know, I think our job is to bring benevolence to our clients, to our family, to the world right now, right? This active use of ventral vehicle for healing. Mm. Yeah. I'm with you, right. Yeah. What yeah. better thing to do with our time and mm -hmm. energy and life experience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And requires that we are in ventral vehicle. So it's good for us and then good for the world, right? Right, right. Oh, so glad you're doing this. And I know I have my book pre-ordered, can't wait for it. And um, I really encourage people to Thank you. do the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, people who have gotten it from Norton have been emailing me and I love hearing their stories about, you know, how it's made a difference to them or how, and I especially love the stories from clinicians who say, it's changed the way I'm working with clients, but it's changed the way I'm living my life. Because that really is the point of polyvagal, right? right. It's going to change the way we live our lives. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dynamite, Deb. Dynamite. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for taking the time and it. for sharing your passion and your wisdom and your heart with us. Thank you. Thank you.